morning, everybody. Welcome back after the social dinner with dancing lessons. I hope everybody enjoyed. Uh, slowly, the lecture hall is filling up. My name is Christoph Mecklenburg, and uh, I am one of the publication chairs of this conference. And today, I have the pleasure to introduce to you today's plenary speaker, Osvaldo Simeone. Osvaldo is a professor in information engineering in the Center for Telecommunications Research Department of Engineering at King's College in London, where he also directs the King's Communications Learning and Information Processing Lab. He received his master's and doctoral degrees in information engineering from Polybi in Milano, Italy, uh, in 2001 and 2005, respectively. And after that, from 2006 to 17, he was a faculty member of the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, where he was affiliated with the Center for Wireless Information Processing. Professor Simeone's research interests include information theory, machine learning, of course, wireless communications, neuromorphic computing, and quantum machine learning. Also, he wrote a book recently <coughs> um, that you might be interested in reading after his inspiring talk. Osvaldo, welcome here. Thank you for that. Thank you, Christopher, for the introduction and to the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor also. Um, okay, so what I'd like to discuss today, and I hope you can hear me well, is how to um, design and implement reliable AI for engineering. And so let me start first by explaining what I mean by reliable, by reliability, as this term can mean different things to different people. So for me here, a reliable AI, I will call a machine learning model, an AI model, and reliable, if you can provide precise measures of its certainty or uncertainty. That is, when providing a decision that is likely to be correct, it will also attach to it a high level of confidence. And when making a decision that is not likely to be correct, it will assign to it a low level of confidence. And so in a sense, as we'll discuss, such a reliable model will know what it knows, Right? providing a high level of confidence in decisions that are likely to be correct, and know when it doesn't know, right? providing low levels of confidence in decisions that are not likely to be correct. And I'll be arguing that this is a very important requirement uh, whenever AI is to be used for reliable decision making, and in particular for, for engineering. Okay, this is a joint work with a number of collaborators, postdocs, and students, and you see their names as I'll uh, describe several papers as we go along in this talk. Okay, so let me start by motivating uh, this line of research on reliable AI. So first off, um, as you probably know, a, uh, an AI model typically outputs not just a decision, but also a level of confidence in that decision. And this applies to the simplest uh, feedforward neural network and also to the more modern large language models based on transport. So the way it works is illustrated in this somewhat outdated, perhaps, uh, example. So a machine learning model takes an input, let's say an image, and output a uh, probability distribution over, implicitly or explicitly, <coughs> over all possible output values. Right? And so, for instance, here we have these possible output values that are highlighted, and these bars represent the confidence levels that the model has in each one of these outputs being the correct one. Right. So the higher the bar, the larger the confidence that the model has when making one of these decisions. Okay. And so you can interpret these bars, so these probabilities, as, again, the level of confidence the model has, or conversely, as the uncertainty that the model has in making any one of these decisions. Okay. Now, the starting point of this whole line of research is that um, it's well known that when uh, deep learning-based AI model fails, makes a mistake, and of course, they are bound to make mistakes more or less frequently, they tend to make mistakes very confidently, right? So, for instance, in this example, you may or may not know, 
this here is not the correct breed for this dog. So the machine learning model here is making a classifier, is making a mistake. And it's making this mistake very confidently, right? It's assigning a high level of confidence on this decision, a high bar, right? The high probability of this decision. And a uh, well, very well publicized example of this problem of uh, you know, uh, lack of uh, confidence in you know, uncertainty quantification of uh, these models are hallucinations of large language models, right? Where a large language model, uh, GPT, provides the wrong answer to some prompt and does that very confidently. Right? Okay, and. Um, so we say that uh, deep learning based AI models, therefore, are poorly calibrated. So calibration is the property of uh, being able to provide precise measures of confidence, so measures of confidence that reflect the true accuracy of a certain decision. Right? And so as I was saying before, as I'm also the title of this talk, um, a conversely, an AI model will be well calibrated if, in a sense, it knows what it knows and it knows what it doesn't know. So, when making a decision, as I said before, that is likely to be correct uh, when tested, then the model will also sign a high bar, right? a high confidence level to that decision, indicating that it's very certain that decision is going to be okay. And when instead making a decision that is not likely to be correct, close to a chance random decision, then the model will also spread out its confidence levels across multiple outputs, indicating that it doesn't know. So the model knows that it doesn't know. Okay. And, uh, you know, the, the, of course, the starting point, the premise of, of, of this line of work is that calibration, so this capacity to provide precise measures of confidence, is very important whenever we want to use AI to make uh, reliable decisions. So we, whenever we want to uh, use AI to make some sensitive decisions, as, for instance, in many engineering applications. And just to give you an example, uh, one application of AI to engineering is in general in the general field of digital twin platforms for the control and monitoring of physical systems. So a digital twin is a software that lives in some server and uh, it runs, maintains a model of a physical system, maybe a 3D scene, maybe a telecom network, um, and it maintains this model based on data it has received, it continuously receives from the physical system. Right, so, uh, typically AI tools are used other digital twin to maintain this model. And so the point here is it's very important for this model, other digital twin, to be aware of its uncertainties, to be able to provide precise measures of confidence. And the reason for instance is the safety. So imagine, as in this recent study, that we are to use uh, a digital twin system to help navigate drone in a 3D space. Clearly we want to make sure that that drone doesn't stray away from the geographical area in which the model is up to date and accurate. Right? And for that, the model needs to have, accurate, again, precise measures of uncertainty right? to ensure, in this case, in this case, safety. And calibration is not only important for reliable decision making, but also for robustness. Uh, for instance, it's well known that if a model is overconfident, so it's poorly calibrated, it's also more prone to membership inference attacks. You may know I mean, a membership inference attack is an attack whereby an attacker is trying to find out if a certain data point was used or not in the training of a model. Right? It turns out that if a model is overconfident, it's also easier for an attacker to spot if a certain data point was used or not in the training of the model. And the reason is that that model will respond, let me say, with a higher bar to examples that were seen before. Right? So again, this is a, an important problem also for robustness. Okay, so now the question arises as to why are deep learning based AI models not well calibrated? Right? So if we train a model using standard means, why don't we get a well calibrated model? And the reason is simply that we are not designing the model to be well calibrated, right? We are designing the model to be accurate. We are maximizing some measure of accuracy, which depends on the application. And we are not making any provisions for the case that the model may actually be inaccurate sometimes, may, may fail, right? They're just targeting some you know, maximum accuracy and not making any provisions for the fact that, of course, in practice, the model will make mistakes. And so this calls to mind uh, Alan Turing's quote. He said that uh, if a machine is expected to be infallible, it cannot also be intelligent. 
The point is that if we just target accuracy, we are not giving the machine any means to know what to do when it's actually not accurate, right? When it's like it makes errors. And so the, the key point of this talk would be to argue that if we wish to have calibration as a requirement for you know, the implementation of AI models, um, it is important to keep calibration as a, a core element in our design and not as an afterthought. And I'll particularly uh, discuss that uh, in order to obtain efficient and reliable AI uh, models, we need to make uh, progress along two fronts, and I'll try to cover both. Um, the first is algorithm design. We should design algorithms that do not just optimize accuracy, as is typically the case, but rather use tools from information theory, uh, statistics, statistical learning theory, that target uncertainty quantification, that make uncertainty quantification a key element of the design process. And secondly, uh, I'll also talk about the, the problem of al hardware algorithms for design, whereby I will be arguing that uh, if we wish to again implement efficiently reliable AI algorithms, we shouldn't just use the classical approach of uh, implementing as accurately as we can deterministic processes, but also show that it's important to implement efficiently stochastic processes that can represent and reason about uncertainty. And so this creates some new challenges that lie again at the intersection of hardware and algorithm uh, design. Okay, so according to you, the talk will be divided into two parts, and the first part will be longer than the second part. The first part is about algorithms. So I'll tell you about how we measure calibration, which is a non-trivial problem. And then I'll talk about two different ways in which we can improve calibration when designing algorithms. One is uh, ensembling, which is a classical statistical technique that changes the way in which we optimize these algorithms. And the other one is conformer prediction, which is a class of post hoc calibration methods which apply at, at deployment time. So not during the design, but when you deploy a pre-designed uh, model. And then I'll talk about hardware algorithm for design. And here I'd like to uh, highlight two technologies uh, that appear to be very well suited to implement reliable AI, namely neuromorphic computing and quantum computing. Okay, and then I'll continue. Okay, let's talk about algorithms, and let's talk about how we measure calibration, how we define and measure calibration, which may be something you are not so familiar with, perhaps. Okay, so as I said, a machine learning model, let's say a neural network, like in this picture, takes an input. This input can be an image, can be a prompt, if this is a you know, transformer-based model, and as a function of some vector of parameters, some tensor of parameters, it outputs a probability distribution. This may be implicit or explicit, but conceptually it outputs a probability distribution over the possible outputs of this model. In this case, I only have four outputs, so I can show you uh, simple pictures. And so in this case, we have four possible outputs, and these bars represent the probability, the confidence the model has in each one of these possible outputs being the correct one. So if you want to uh, act on, the, on this output, given this input x, what you can do is you can take as the, uh, your decision class one, because it is the one that is assigned the largest confidence by the model. The model is the most confident in that decision. And then you could also use this number, 0 0.4, so this, the height of this bar, this confidence level, as in some sense a measure of accuracy of that decision, right? The model is telling you that, it has a confidence 0.4 in that decision being the correct one. And so it would be useful if we could use, if we could trust, in a way, this 40%, 0.4, to be the true accuracy of this decision. Okay. And this would be what we mean by a model being well calibrated. So a model would be well calibrated if, when I look at all decisions that have approximately this level of confidence, 0.4, on average, the true accuracy of that decision is 0.4, it's 40%. Okay, so the fraction of decisions that are correct, which have this level of confidence, is actually 40%. So we can trust this number to give us a sense of how accurate this decision is. Okay, and so now the question arises is, how do we measure calibration, right? How do we measure this capacity of a model to provide precise measures of, uh, of, of uh, uncertainty and so there are, this is a very interesting problem, and it's being studied in uh, machine learning, statistics, and currently uh, 
want the, the end goal would be to have something like a reliability diagram shown in this chart. So what the reliability diagram graph does is to plot the accuracy, the true accuracy and precision, versus the confidence the model gives you. Right? And the way you draw this, uh, this diagram is by following the, the, you know, the principles I mentioned just a minute ago. That is, you look at all decisions that have some level of confidence, and then you, know, you look at the average accuracy of those decisions, and then you plot the line. Right? Now, if, the, if the, the confidence level corresponds to the true accuracy of those decisions, on average, decisions on average, then you'll get this straight line. This 45 degrees line, which tells you, well, the accuracy is exactly equal to the confidence. You can trust the bars to give you the true accuracy of the decision. So this would be a perfect, cali perfectly calibrated model. Okay, in practice, the pro any, any practical model would be off this line. So it could, be, uh, it could give you a performance that is above this line, which means that the true accuracy is actually above the confidence. So the model is under confidence. Okay, it's being too modest. Or you could have a situation like this red line, where the accuracy is below the confidence. So the actual accuracy is below what the model promises you as, as, uh, as the confidence, its confidence level. And as I mentioned before, uh, if you try and test deep learning mo models, you'll see that they tend to be essentially all the time overconfident. So what, uh, this is an example from a paper from my group. This, is, uh, this particular example, is we use a classifier to do demodulation over a fading channel. If you know what that means, but it's basically a classifier. And what you see here, these blue bars, are an estimate of that line that I showed you before. We need to have bars, not a, not a smooth line, because we need to estimate those accuracies, and so we need to bin the confidence level. Okay, so that's why you get this piecewise approximation. Anyway, these blue bars represent that line that I showed you before. And you can see we are quite below the 45 degrees line, this rest line, corresponding to perfect calibration. And so that, that means the model is overconfident. For instance, when the model tells you that it believes in, in, a, in a decision with a confidence between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9, the true accuracy of that decision is below 0 0.6. Okay, so you can't trust what the model tells you. Okay. And these red parts correspond to the gap between the perfect calibration and the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the the, the, the actual calibration that you get. So it's a measure of calibration error. And I should say that this applies not only to you know, the simple feedforward networks that we use here, or convolutional neural networks, but also to more modern uh, models that use, for instance, uh, transformers. For instance, this is a picture taken from the recent OpenAI report on GPT-4, you may have seen it. And what uh, OpenAI does is to report this uh, reliability diagram. And as you can see, as you know, as per the figure that I showed before, the you know, GPT-4, uh, in this case, uh, is significantly overconfident in providing decisions to some specific tests. You see we are below the 45 degrees line. Now it's important to stress that accuracy and confidence and uh, calibration, sorry, are two distinct requirements. And so to, to illustrate this, this is a figure I've taken from a very recent paper. It shows the accuracy on the vertical axis and the calibration error on the horizontal axis. The calibration error is a weighted sum of those red gaps that I showed before. Each point here is the performance of a different model for the same data set, CIFAR 10, I think, in this case. So you can see that different models have different uh, pairs of performance in terms of accuracy and calibration. And one thing you can also notice, uh, I added this red line myself, is that there can be also trade-off between these two so you may, in order to get the smaller calibration error, so to move to this side, you may have to give up some accuracy. So this, there can be a tension between accuracy and calibration. Another thing that is, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, calibration and accuracy. Another thing that is known is that typically having larger models, even if it can improve uh, accuracy, can impair calibration. So again, taking from the same paper, you see here, this is uh, performance in terms of calibration and accuracy. For models of different sizes, this, the, you know, the size of these balls represent the size of the model. And you can see increasing the size here is increasing the accuracy, but making the calibration error worse. Okay. 
And so this also relates, uh, make, create some connections between um, uh, calibration error and overfitting. And in fact, there is some interesting connection there. Okay, so hopefully this gives you an idea about the complexity of thinking about calibration and how it's different from thinking about accuracy. And last, let's think about how we can improve calibration when we either design or implement our AI algorithm. So, one classical way to improve calibration from statistics is ensembling, which you probably have used in one way or another. The idea is straightforward. The idea is, instead of relying on a single model to make a decision, because that model can be overconfident, let's use multiple models to make a decision, and then combine the opinions of all these models, since every model may be overconfident in different ways, Maybe when we combine their decisions, we can get a better calibrated uh, decision. Okay, so the way it works is that you get an input, maybe a prompt or an image, and you use, uh, instead of using a single model, maybe a single neural network, you use multiple neural networks, and each one will give you a different output, and then you combine these outputs to make a final decision. Okay, this is something is conceptually generated, this ensemble of models is conceptually generated by drawing from some distribution of models. And this distribution can be obtained in different ways. Maybe you can use different samples where you just retrain your model starting from a different initialization. You can use things like bootstrapping or more principal Bayesian, uh, Bayesian learning algorithms. The idea is that this something allows you to improve calibration and to see how this is done, think about how we make, well, forecasters make uh, weather forecasts. So, a weather forecast is not made just based on a single model, but rather by running multiple models, right? The multiple simulators you see here, and then looking at the decisions of these multiple models. And now the uncertainty, so or conversely confidence of a decision, can be made by looking at the variance of these decisions, of these predictions. If the models, the forecasters, forecast models right here, differ quite a bit in their predictions. Right? So if they disagree, then we can say there is a high level of uncertainty, right? low level of confidence in whatever decision we make. And if instead the models tend to agree, there is a low variance, then we have a, can give a high level of confidence, a low uncertainty level. And indeed, using uh, ensembling can improve calibration very significantly. This is the, for the same example that I showed you before, remember the modulation of our fading channel. Uh, from one of our papers. This is what happens after you use ensembling. And in particular here, we designed a special way to design the distribution of the models using Bayesian meta-learning. So this is an approach that is Bayesian and uses data from multiple related problems. And you can see that now the gaps are much smaller, right? The gap between perfect calibration and the performance we actually get is very small, much smaller. And so the model is much better calibrated. Okay, so we have seen that using calibration, uh, ensembling can improve calibration, although I should mention that there is no theoretical guarantee that this will happen. So in practice, if you do it, you get the improvements that I've shown, but there is no proof, unless you are willing to make very strong assumptions that uh, calibration will improve. Now uh, there is an alternative and complementary class of methods, which, is, which are called post-op calibration methods. So these apply after you design the system. Maybe you're even using ensembling, so it can be used on top of ensembling. So you have a model that is already there, and you would like to improve the calibration of this model in a post hoc way. And typically, what you do is by using some additional data that you haven't used for training. Okay. So the idea is this: you take uh, and you know the first class of techniques that you may have used, and they're very popular, work like this: you take a model like this one that may be overconfident. And now you, you keep, so you use some data set that you haven't used for training. And what you do now is you try to, in some sense, recalibrate these probabilities by trying and, and match the distribution, you know, these distributions here, that you see on this additional data set that you haven't used before. So you do an additional uh, step in which you try to basically correct these bars so that they become closer to the distributions you see in this additional data set. So what this does is essentially to scale down this overconfidence typically. And there are techniques, different techniques to do this, such as flat scaling, temperature scaling, and many of these are standard in, in many machine learning packages. I'm going to show you now. 
So these techniques also tend to work quite well. They can be combined with something. Uh, again, they provide no theoretical guarantee at all. Uh, and the reason is that, for instance, they may even overfit the validation dataset. But they are very useful in practice and definitely uh, it's advisable to use them. Now, what I would like to focus on is a different class of post-doc validation techniques, which is kind of emerging now in machine learning, but it's well known, it's been well known in statistics for a while, which is known as conformal prediction. I think these are very interesting tools, very simple to implement, as you will see, and they provide strong theoretical guarantees of reliability. So I'd like to focus on this one for a little bit here. So what's, what does conformal prediction do? Um, so it takes a probabilistic predictor, you know, predictor that gives you those bars that we've been discussing, which can be overconfident, poorly calibrated, and turns it into a well-calibrated set predictor. Not, no longer a probabilistic predictor. In some sense, it's less, this you know, conformal prediction is less ambitious than the other schemes that try to perfectly recalibrate all the probabilities. Uh, so it extracts something that gives you less information, but, which is a set predictor, but the set predictor now is perfectly calibrated and there is a theorem that tells you that it's okay. Okay, so what's a set predictor? A set predictor takes an input, an image, a prompt, and output, not a bar, not a probability for every possible output, right? It doesn't give you a confidence level for every output, but it just gives you a label that tells you if that output is plausible or not for that input, right? So this ticks and it crosses. So you give an input and the output, you get simply this output is plausible or not. So at the end, you get a set of plausible outputs, a predicted set of plausible outputs, and that's the output of the model. Okay. So given an input, you get a set, and the model tells you your answer should be in this set. Okay, that's what we want. Uh, now, this output is less informative than knowing all the bars that I talked about before, but it still gives you some uh, useful and actionable potential information, and it also gives you a measure of uncertainty. Because the bigger this, side, this, this predicted set is, the more uncertain the model is in making a certain decision. Okay, so let me give you some example. For instance, if you use a, an image classifier, a set predictor will give you an output like in this chart, where depending on the difficulty of the example, you may get a single label, right? A single label in the predicted set, so the model is sure that this is this particular breed of animal, this particular animal, right? This particular breed of squirrel. And, uh, or if the image is more complicated to classify, you may get set that sets that include more labels. And the more difficult the image is, the bigger your predicted set becomes. This idea, conformal prediction, set prediction, is also being applied recently to large, large language models. So for instance, here you see an example in which uh, the authors of this interesting paper propose that the language model will give you not just one output, not just one answer, but rather gives you a set of answers with the promise that one of these answers will have some desirable property of precision. Okay, so now we have, you know, we're saying we take a probabilistic predictor, we get a set predictor, and we hope that, of course, we can do something with that set. But what now, what do I mean now when I say that that set predictor is well calibrated? Because the notion of calibration that I had before is no longer applicable, because I don't, I no longer have this confidence probability. I have just a set. So the, the, the notion of calibration for a predicted set is as follows. You fix some probability, some coverage probability you want. I call it one minus alpha here, let's say 90%. And then we'll say that the set predictor is well calibrated and 90%. If, I think it's quite intuitive, the probability that the true answer is in the set is 90%, at least 90%. Okay, so that's the notion of, so you can trust the set predictor, because you know that the answer is there with some probability that you want. Okay, and the beauty is, as I mentioned before, that if you use conformal prediction, you can guarantee this condition for any one minus alpha level that you want. So to see how this is done, uh, so the idea again would be we start from a probabilistic predictor like this one, which may not be well calibrated. Somehow we extract a set predictor that is well calibrated at any level one minus alpha. To see how this is done, let's uh, consider kind of a thought experiment where our predict predictor here is already well calibrated. Okay, this is not of interest, but it's just to think about the problem. So let's say I can trust these bars 
to be the true accuracy, right? So this is the true accuracy of this label, and so on. So now how can I extract the set predictor that covers the true answer with probability, let's say, 60% in this example? Okay, it's very simple. I take the, since I want the set to be small, I take the classes that have the largest probability assigned to them, let's say in this case plus one and plus plus three, and when the sum of these probabilities crosses the 60% threshold that I want, I stop it. Right? So I put in my predicted set, one and three, and if I trust these bars to be true accuracies, then definitely the true answer will be there with probability 60%. Right? The thing is that this approach doesn't work, of course, because I cannot trust these bars. So what I've done here is basically just going to, to formalize the approach is that in some way I move the threshold right, to this side across the, uh, these bars. I have included in my predicted set the classes that, whose bars I meet as I move down this threshold. And then I stop when the sum of the heights of these bars is 60% in my example. Right? That's what I But again, I cannot do this by just trusting the bars because this predictors are generally not well calibrated. So what conformal prediction does is to find this threshold, not by trusting that these bars are true measures of accuracy, but by using additional information. And this can take two forms. So there is a class of offline conformal prediction schemes that use uh, validation data set, like the schemes I described before. So some data you haven't used before. And then there's online conformal prediction that uses feedback. So you make a decision, you get feedback, and then it goes on like that. Now I wanted to briefly explain how these two schemes work, not so much because I would like to convey the details, which are very simple, but just to convey how simple these schemes are. So this is just a few lines of code you can add on top of an existing AI you know, neural network uh, deployment, and what you get in return is you know, provable reliability, you know, calibration. So let me try to explain briefly how these two things work, and again, maybe the details won't be immediately clear, but hopefully the message will be this is very simple. So how does offline conformal prediction work? So simply it works like this. You take your validation data set, which you haven't seen before. You have your model that you have pre-trained, right? We are not changing the model. And then we are just checking the confidence level that the model gives to each one of these examples. These are labeled, so you can look at the confidence the model gives in the true label. Okay. So you look at, you know, for this example, for instance, the model gives a middle uh, confidence in the true answer. Now you just put all the confidence levels you have observed in this data set, and you do this offline, on this line. Now remember, what I want is to find the threshold on the confidence levels, so that all the classes that are above the threshold I include, and below I don't include. So very simply, where should I put this threshold? The threshold is, is put in, in here, in this case, in such a way that above this threshold, I have a fraction one minus alpha of the largest confidence levels. Okay, and remember, one minus alpha is the level of confidence, the, the level of reliability I'm looking for. Okay, so very simply, I find the threshold, and once I have this threshold, I can use it on any new input by, make, by just including the, in the predicted set all labels whose uh, confidence is above this threshold. Okay, so the bottom line is, you find a threshold using some additional data, and then you just use that threshold to include in the predicted set all classes whose confidence is above the threshold. Okay, it's really very few lines of code. And the, the threshold can be, of course, found before you deploy the system. Okay, online conformal prediction works a bit differently. So here, instead, you don't have a validation data set, which you may not have, right? But what you, you have is that you get feedback for the decisions you make. So you get an input, and you produce your predicted set, maybe in this case two labels, and then somebody tells you if the true answer is in that uh, set or not. Okay, and then very simply, you're going to use that feedback to change the threshold. So if you see that you're making too many mistakes, basically you can't make more than alpha mistakes, right? fraction alpha of the states, then you're going to move the threshold down. Otherwise, you move it up. And uh, so you can actually uh, formalize this, uh, uh, this protocol as a form of online gradient descent. You just move the threshold up and down depending on the feedback. 
And again, it's super simple to implement. And the beauty is that both of these approaches guarantee calibration. So that is, you give me some level one minus alpha, and by running one of these schemes, I can guarantee that the predicted set contains the true answer in that probability. For offline conformal prediction, the guarantee is on average with respect to the validation and test data. And for online, there is no averaging, there is no ensemble averaging, there's just an average over time. The bottom line is that, again, you can guarantee the rest of the condition. As far as I know, this is basically the only approach that allows you to provably uh, guarantee calibration. So, in some sense, conformal prediction, if you use conformal prediction, you're changing the design problem. So, typically, we want to design a system so that it's accurate. Or reliable. Here, no. Reliability is guaranteed. No matter how bad your model is, it will always be reliable. What you're not guaranteed is that it's useful. So it may be very uninformative. Right? The reason is that the, the, uh, after you use conformal prediction, you may get a predicted set that includes all possible answers. Right? Definitely, that is well calibrated. Right? It definitely includes also two answers, but it's not useful. So now the design changes. You don't want to enhance, you know, improve uh, reliability. You want to improve informativeness. You want to make sure that you're learning your inference algorithm that you learn um, produces small predicted sets when used with conformal prediction. So in some recent work that we presented here last year, we proposed an approach to just to do just that. That is to design algorithms that can learn, so learning to learn, uh, that can learn procedures that when applied to some data give you algorithms that when combined with conformal prediction give you small sets. Okay, and see this was done using again meta learning, so data from multiple tasks, and we tested it on many examples. Well, I'm showing here an example of um, classifying radio signals, phase length signals. And what we found is that this can definitely significantly decrease the size of these predicted sets. So, hopefully the message is clear. You just add a few lines of code, and what you get is a, uh, a way to guarantee that these predicted sets are well calibrated. And so now this can be applied to many, I think, applications in engineering in which we can make use of set predictors. Right? So the question is, if your application can do something useful, actionable, by knowing these set predictors. And let me give you a couple of examples of things we worked on in my group. So this is an example of proactive resource allocation, which is quite important for 5G and 6G. I'll, I'll describe this briefly. The idea is as follows. You know, time goes down this way, and there are some commodities, some packets in the telecom network that arrive over time. Time is you know, one slice of time is horizontal like that. And these are commodities are represented by these purple blocks. So you have this uh, packet that arrive in the future, right, across time. And a scheduler needs to assign resources to these packets, to these commodities, in advance because of latency constraints. So proactively allocate resources. To do so, it needs to use a predictor. So the predictor will indicate whether these packets will arrive or not, and the scheduler will assign resources accordingly. Now what can happen is that the predictor maybe underestimates the probability of packets arrival. And so if a uh, scheduler trusts that predictor, it will not allocate enough resources. So you will undercover the, you know, the, the arrivals of this packet. And if instead the predictor is overzealous, right, overconfident, uh, assigns too high a probability to the arrivals of packets, you will assign too many resources, right, which I hope is clear, it's this purple blocks here. And now what you can do simply is you put a online conformal prediction loop around the predictor, and then what that does is that it stabilizes, it calibrates the predictor, and now you can make sure that your scheduler using the predictor will always meet some coverage probability while also not assigning too many resources. Okay? It is a very simple loop, just using online conformal prediction and coupling. Another application we looked at, and I'll mention this very quickly, but maybe some of you are interested, is to uh, black box optimization using Bayesian optimization. So as you may know, Bayesian optimization is a way to optimize black box functions by keeping track of the uncertainty on the function you want to optimize. And in some cases, there are safety constraints. So you don't want to attempt too many solutions that may be unsafe, but you don't really know if a solution will be unsafe or not. And so one way to ensure that you don't try too many unsafe solutions 
is again to put an online confirm application loop on top of conventional JSON optimizations. If you're interested, again, this is, these are the, these are the references in this topic. Okay, so I have um, talked a little bit about how to design algorithms that are better calibrated, and uh, I hope that some of you will be you know, maybe encouraged to use these things. Now, I very briefly would like to discuss the problem of implementing reliable AI uh, in hardware. And I'd like to specifically focus on how we can implement ensembling. So I mentioned in the first part that ensembling is very important, it's a very simple and principled technique to improve calibration. And what you do is, instead of using a single model, right, to make a decision, you run multiple models, and then you combine the decisions of this model. And if you try to implement ensembling in hardware, you run into the following problem that in order for the ensemble to be useful, you need to have some diversity. The models need to be different, and they need to be random. So what you need to do is to include additional hardware elements that generate randomness. And this could be quite a lot if you think about large models. And you have to add a lot of random number generators to create these ensembles. And if you think about it, this is quite efficient because randomness is already there in the computing platform, in the physical computing platform. Think about thermal noise in electronics, for instance. And so the idea that I would like to briefly explore here is that of using hardware-generated randomness as a computational resource to implement in some. So the idea is, instead of adding noise from the outside, let's use the noise that is already there to create these ensembles and to make decisions that are better calibrated. And I'll bring your attention to two technologies that do this in a way for free very efficiently. One is in-memory computing, or neural network computing. And here, the randomness comes from the analog nature of the devices that can be used for in-memory computing. And the other one is quantum computing, in which instead the randomness comes from the inherent statisticity of quantum measurements. You may know about the collapse of the waveform. Right? Every time you measure the quantum system, it collapses in an unpredictable way, in a probabilistic way, to some uh, discrete measurement. And I should say that this idea of using hardware-generated randomness applies more generally, not just to reliable AI, but to other signal processing primitives that need randomness. For instance, uh, you know, diffusion models for generative AI. Another thing that we looked at in my group is not just to use hardware-generated noise, but also communication channel-generated noise. Because in decentralized platforms, AI platforms, you also have communication noise. And that noise can also be useful, as we proved in our work, to, uh, to make the overall uh, AI algorithms more reliable when implemented in wireless systems. So what I'd like to do next is to briefly talk about these two technologies, neuromorphic computing and quantum AI, uh, quantum computing, as it pertains their possible use for reliable AI. Okay. So let's start with neuromorphic computing. Now, I'm sure everybody knows that a computer conventionally uses a von Neumann architecture, which separates memory and processing. And you also know, because you read it in the newspaper quite a lot, that this is not a good architecture for uh, AI. Right? Because what you, in this case, if you want to run an AI algorithm on such a platform, you need to keep fetching and storing data, and this creates a bottleneck, and it's not very efficient right? in terms of area, energy, and time. So an alternative architecture that can, uh, computing architecture that can make some functionalities faster and more efficient is in-memory computing. The idea is to collocate memory and processing. So the same elements that store information, store data, can also do computing. And this typically are some form of memoristic devices. And typically the operations are linear operations for AI. So these platforms are also known as uh, neuromorphic because our brains also apparently don't separate memory and processing the same way that these chips do. And now there are, there are a family of such neuromorphic chips in uh, commercially available or as prototypes. And there are two main classes I'd like to highlight here. There are some devices that are fully digital, right? They use CMOS standard technologies. One of them that is quite well established is Intel's Loigi. If you haven't heard about it, I recommend you take a look. And there's another class of devices, typically uh, maybe designed by several startups, 
the drawing step makes analog and digital. So what they do, they, they replace some digital elements with analog devices. These are nanoscale devices, which are known, known as non-volatile memory devices, that can store information and also carry out um, linear operations, essentially. Okay. But they act as resistance, so you can do that by using standard laws of uh, you know, electrical systems. Um, now, these analog, mixed analog digital devices can be potentially more efficient in terms of area, they're smaller, they consume less energy, but they have a, a key problem that analog devices are, of course, noisy. So, if you try to read from one, from one of analog devices, every time you read, you get a different number. There is some noise there that you can characterize. So, this typically is a problem. And so, what people do is, for instance, they just run the system many times and they average out the noise. So what we have proposed in some recent work, uh, also other, other groups are following the same ideas, is to not try to mitigate that noise, but use it to implement in some way. So the idea is these devices will give weights of a neural network. Now every time I read it, I'll get a different weight. That's not a problem because I want to implement in some way. So if I make sure that the distribution of that noise is useful, then I can just natively use this platform to perform for free in some way. Every time you read it, I get a different model, and then I can average the decisions of different models. So we implemented this idea using a particular class of devices known as phase change memory, PCM. And we found that uh, by you know, properly designing, of course, the way we should use this noise, we can obtain performance in terms of accuracy and calibration that are essentially the same as a digital system that is much bigger, much, much bigger area footprint at a much lower scale. This is an ongoing work, but I think it's very promising. Okay, so maybe this gives you some idea of how in-memory computing can be used for, for reliable AI. And let me now finally briefly talk about quantum computing, which is definitely a more futuristic technology. But the, the reason why I'm bringing this up here is some of this kind of somewhat practical thought, is that you know quantum computing has made some significant strides towards wider applicability. Right? So right now you can access from your laptop, several quantum computers, and use them. We do that routinely in my group. Not only that, but um, there is a pretty simple way to uh, program quantum computers now, which is called quantum machine learning. And so it's a very simple optimization-based technique that we, we can all understand in this room. And so this gives us a way to really use these uh, devices, even though we are not experts in uh, business. So let me just explain briefly how this would work, a quantum computer would work, and why I'm bringing it up here. So, in some way, a quantum computer, a gate-based quantum computer, is an in-memory processor, right? Like the ones I described before, in the sense that instead of having a classical memory of bits, now you have a quantum memory of qubits. Okay, so qubits are quantum mechanical devices. When you measure them, you get a bit, but they're quantum mechanical, they're not classical. And so the way a quantum computer works is that it applies operations, which are called gates, on this memory over time. So time in this picture flows this way. You apply these gates, which are these blocks, to some operations. You change the state of this memory. And then you get to the end of this process. And now you want to extract information. And the way you extract information, you make a measurement. And as you probably know, if I have n qubits here in this memory, when I measure it, I get n bits of the output. And the interesting thing is that these bits are random. They are random bits. And they are unpredictably random in the sense that even if I knew the state here of the qubits, I wouldn't be able to predict exactly what I'm going to get. So they are random. And the distribution of these bits depends on the operation that I've done here. So you can think of a quantum computer from this perspective as a center of a center of discrete data. It's a probabilistic model that generates discrete data. And famously, it can generate discrete data that it will be very hard to generate using classical means. So a lot of the quantum supremacy or advantage uh, claims like Google's from 2019 rest on this fact that if you want to generate that discrete data from that distribution using a classical computer, it would take you a long time and a lot of big space. 
then of course, how much space and how much time is something that is being debated. But the point is that these distributions are complex, complicated, large dimensional distributions. Think of the fact that if you have n bits, the distribution is defined by 2 to the n number. So it's very easy to get very quickly to complicated distribution. Okay, so now we have these distributions, and how do we make sure that these distributions over bits is useful? It does something that we care about. This is where quantum machine learning comes in. So quantum machine learning is a way of controlling this distribution, essentially. And the way it's done is that you take your PC, you connect it maybe through a cloud interface to a quantum computer. Your PC looks at these samples produced by the quantum computer and tries to adjust the operation of the gates, which I depend on some parameters theta. And if you do this in a loop, like in classical machine learning, until the distribution that comes out is something that you like, right? that makes sense for your application. And so one way in which we, we can use this type of model, which are centered, is to implement reliable AI. So this is something we have studied in a recent paper. So the idea here is we have a quantum computer that can generate samples from complex discrete distributions. Now we can use these samples as weights, so the outputs as weights for a discrete neural network. Right? And, and to implement an ensemble of such neural networks. And the interesting thing here is that we can, by using such quantum models, we can use pretty very complicated discrete distributions that would be very hard to realize using classical means and classical hardware. Of course, now the testing we can do is very small scale, but our results show that at that scale, which is scaled down, of course, the classical systems also accordingly, the advantages of quantum computers are very simple. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, so I tried to talk a little bit about how we can design and implement uh, reliable AI algorithms that in a way you know when they know and know when they don't know. And hopefully at the beginning of the talk I managed to convince you that this is useful, this requirement is useful and important in many applications in engineering, and that it requires, there are interesting directions to explore in terms of uh, both algorithm design for signal processing faults but also uh, in, you know, interplay with hardware implementation. And so here I have a few uh, directions where I suggest for this, so I just mentioned a couple of them. So there, there are interesting interplays between calibration and privacy, because they're both based on, in some way, randomizing the model. Fairness, because fairness, in a way, is a generalization of, uh, of calibration, if you define mathematically. And also explainability, in that you may use a well calibrated model to explain, and you may also be interested to explain why a model is confident or not confident, which is something that is being looked at very, you know, uh, at a very high level for now. There's also the interesting question of developing language models that are well calibrated. I mentioned some high profile studies earlier, but this is a big problem. We want, of course, uh, large language models to be able to quantify the uncertainty so we can trust them. And there's also the interesting problem of uh, defining uh, use cases for the two technologies that I mentioned, neomorphic computing and quantum computing for engineering. Okay, so with that, I'll conclude, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I would like to ask you, in your opinion, uh, why are uh, deep models so overconfident? Uh, I've seen there are some theories, but what is your own opinion about that? Yes, so typically the, the way you train a model is to maximize the likelihood, right? to, to minimize the, the cross-entropy loss. If you think about it, the cross-entropy loss is minimizing the the distance between the distribution the model gives you and the data distribution. So typically what happens is that you overfit that criterion. So your model is becoming very confident on the example in the training set. And this dumbness doesn't necessarily affect the accuracy. That's the thing. Right? So you, when you overfit the cross-entropy, 
it doesn't necessarily affect the accuracy because you measure the accuracy using other criteria, like the probability of error, for instance. So the, there are some studies, there is a famous paper by Guo et al. that started this whole uh, study of calibration in modern models. And what it shows is that this is basically one of the possible mechanisms, that you're overfitting the cross entropy in terms of the cross entropy, but not overfitting in terms of the probability of error. And so the accuracy is okay, but the calibration, because the calibration cares about the specific probabilities the model outputs, uh, is not, is not. Good. If that is the case, then why uh, larger models tend to be uh, more uh, overconfident if it is just about the loss? I've, I've seen a paper, if I remember correctly, was uh, saying that part of the reason was more about um, even rationalization had something to do, like some, some part of the inner architecture had some problem, but uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm sure the architecture plays an important role. It's a bit difficult though to, to exactly understand which parts of the architecture leads to, lead to. I think maybe if you think that uh, calibration, lack of calibration comes from overfitting the criterion that you use for training, then larger models will overfit more, and so they will have poor calibration. So in that sense, you are explaining that phenomenon. Uh, yes. Thank you for your answer. Talk. Um, you were talking about ensembling as a way um, from diverse models. Um, and the thought occurred to me, um, you're generating diverse models, um, maybe with random numbers, but they're all training on the same data. Is there some way to get more diversity by using different data? Yeah. So yeah, so the ensembling can be designed in different ways. One way, which is standard in statistics, is to use things like bootstrapping, anyway, resampling techniques. So the way those work is that you resample data sets from the same data set, so you take this, you know, subsets, possibly even with replacement, and then you train a model. So by doing this, you, you ensure that there is some level of diversity by using different data. Another approach is to use a Bayesian, uh, Bayesian framework, in which instead this diversity is somehow facilitated by uh, defining a prior on these parameters that imposes some initial uncertainty level. So by reason learning, what it does is that it tries not to stray too far away from that prior, depending on how much data you have. And so this also ensures that you don't uh, you don't over trust the data. So yeah, these two approaches can be both used, and they both both follow the same principle. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, uh, in classical signal processing, so to speak, uh, for instance, bias and model, you can compute credibility intervals, and you know, with respect to what part of the model you can associate the uncertainty. Um, how does that work with AI? How is, is there any way to know what exactly deep learning creates uncertainty with respect to what in the data or in the model? Yeah, so I, I guess, uh, I'm not sure if you understand, but typically in machine learning, one a distinction is made between aleatoric uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty. So aleatoric uncertainty is the part of the uncertainty that tries to capture the inherent noisiness of the data. So even if you have all the data in the world, because the, the, the problem you're studying is inherently noisy, aleatoric uncertainty will not go down. So that's the irreducible part of the uncertainty. Is the part that models the noisiness in the world in the data collection process. Another is epistemic uncertainty, which is instead the uncertainty that has to do with the fact that you have limited data. If you had all the data in the world, you'd be able to zoom in on the best model, but because you don't have infinite data, you, you have to account for the opinions of these multiple models, which are almost equally plausible given the data that you have, right? depending also on the prior. So what Bayesian learning tries to do is to capture the second form of uh, uncertainty, so the epistemic uncertainty, that is related to the fact that you have limited data, and it's uncertainty typically in the space of models. And so it only tells you what the uncertainty is in the space of your parameterization. Um, there are also ways, and I'm sure you most of you know, 
to quantify and set in the space of functions, of predictive functions, like you know, Gaussian processes, for example. But yeah, the idea is to capture uh, the stem uncertainty. So that's the typical differentiation that is made in, that is made in, in, this, in this literature. I hope that addresses more or less your question. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, I have uh, one uh, remark and uh, one question. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I'm not a defender of the ChatGPT4 in relation to that, but I think that you are not fair because ChatGPT4 was not designed to be accurate. It was designed to do something else. So if it, did, it could give answers that are probable but not absolutely accurate, so it's fine if it is overconfident. I don't think it's a problem with it. Uh, a small question about the fact that you said that the uh, uh, bigger models uh, are not uh, uh, more confident. In the in the plot you you, you showed in, in the beginning of the presentation about two colors, blue and red. Yeah. And for the blue, if I remember well, that no. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the red color, you're right. You increase the model, you don't get more uh, accuracy, but uh, more confidence. But for the, for the blue one, I think it works. So, what, what's the yeah, difference yeah. between the two colors and why it works here? Yes, yes. I, 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 I know I can't remember exactly what the difference is, but I was, uh, you know, in this case, they are increasing the size of the model. In this case, they're doing something else. To be honest, I can't remember exactly what they're doing <laughs> oh, for those, right? Sorry. I want to bring your attention to those. I'll check and I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I will not another question about the quantum computing, but I, I think I prefer to talk to you after the talk. Okay, possible. anyway, the, 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 your, on your first comment, I agree. In fact, this was one of my main points in this talk, that uh, these systems are not designed to be well calibrated, they're not designed to be reliable, and maybe they should be. So using these techniques, you can make them. But if you're not interested in calibration, then you shouldn't be able to. Please don't enhance judge <laughs> It's not my responsibility. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask you this question. How does this actually relate to this phenomenon of double descent? So if we increase the number of features that have been like cases observed that we can actually get like the like this error very low. So if that's the case, maybe the solution is to actually increase the number of like let's say parameters, this large language model to like a very massive numbers and then maybe we have like a breakthrough. I, I am familiar with uh, the double descent. I know that it's being debated and discussed, and it's not intended to wide up and so on. But yeah, just to, for those of you who don't know, my understanding is that this is a phenomenon that says that as you increase the model, at the beginning, uh, things get worse because you have overfitting, but then after the point of interpolation, where you can perfectly describe the things, that somehow things get better in terms of accuracy. And uh, so as far as I know, there is no such phenomenon being observed for calibration error. So I'm not familiar with any study that says that a similar improvement happens after a faithful threshold. So to be honest, this is a, probably a very interesting thing to explore, right? If some kind of double descent may also happen for calibration. My impression based on the studies that are out there is that they may not be the case, uh, but it's a very interesting question. And then I had also one question on one case you were presenting this large language model and then you were sending a query and there were four possible, let's say, options so you can yeah. choose between. Does this give too much information to actually the people that are sending queries? So that might leave this problem that this model is too exposed that we can actually like, construct the, like, the data or ah, okay. privacy issues. Okay, that's another interesting question. So I guess the question here is, uh, if we use an approach like this one, where the, predict the, the predictor gives you not just one answer, but multiple answers, may it be that this model is more prone to membership difference effects? Not studied. Uh, in fact, I am looking at this problem with some, uh, some students. It's a, another interesting question. I don't think, uh, yeah, this has been looked at simply. We don't know. 
Thank you so much. But I agree with you that it should be replaced. Uh, it's probably replaced. But another interesting thing there is to compare the robustness of the self predictor versus a probabilistic predictor. So in that case, I think the self predictor is actually better than, in terms of robustness than a probabilistic predictor. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, well, thank you very much for the talk. Um, uh, sorry, I was not here in the first few minutes in case I make a wrong, uh, you know, some, some questions which is not relevant. Uh, you mentioned very nicely about uncertainty, um, about uncertainty of the model and the product and everything. But now, uh, there is another issue, especially when you have large data and that's to do with uncertainty in labeling the data, which is very common in, in some fields. Uh, so uh, this can sometimes be tackled in non, say, deep learning or AI networks, but how can the model be changed, you know, in terms of that uncertainty in the labeling of the original data? Have you? Have you done anything on this? Uh, okay, so if you, I guess this relates to the previous answer. So I guess the one way to think about this uncertainty in the labeling as, is as aleatoric uncertainty, in the sense that the way you collect data is inherently random. Right? So typically, unless you have some clean data that you can refer to, to understand the differences and to make assessments about what's noise label or unknowing label, these models can just quantify the aleatoric uncertainty. And I, I am not familiar with techniques that can somehow improve over that problem. If instead this noisy, this noise, for instance, occurs only in one of the phases, maybe it happens only during training, but then uh, you know this noise goes away, or it happens in one of the, for instance, the validation data, or not in the training data, and so on. So if there's some kind of domain shift or distribution shift, yeah, then there are ways to try to understand how much this uh, noise problem has become worse and try to compensate for it. There are several techniques also for component prediction in this regard. I'm not too familiar with the problem, so perhaps my answer is incomplete. Well, thank you very much, thank you. Let's stick to this kettle, and if you want to have coffee before the sessions, we'll stop here. Yeah.